Welcome to Senadiman Education Foundation again. Jimmy Wales, the founder of uh, Wikipedia, said, "Imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. That's what we are doing. So we are doing a humble attempt to give the free access to the sum of geosurgical knowledge." in a single platform free of cost actually we started this journey in 2012 by releasing a set of dvds by sion han kim at trivandrum south india then he visited our place and we started our fellowship programs and contact classes and we give hands on training both in dry lab and in in Uh, actual scenario we have six months and one year fellowship program which is hands on in basic and advanced laparoscopy surgeries and we don't collect any fee foreign candidates have to produce temporary registration certificate from indian medical council and with the advent of covid we started the online programs and uh, the logo was released by none other than dr palani velu himself in july 2020 and after that we started having live surgeries in one pla online platform we did a lab anti recession facebook live in learning general surgery uh, facebook group in august we did a lab wipul in youtube which come which was completed in uh, 100 minutes and the link was shared to the members of senadipin education foundation we do live lectures with the world leaders like dr adar choudhury and we from the last webinar onwards we started giving e certificates and uh, the certificates are distributed uh, to their uh, email ids uh, analyzing the screen time of the participants in the webinar we have got uh, uh, three whatsapp groups of senadipin education foundation all are full and uh, on facebook group Uh, about uh, 800 members and uh, last week we completed 25 webinar 25 webinars we completed with uh, the eminent figures in the field of ga surgery and last time it was dr nagakawa yuchi and dr palini velu about uh, laparoscopy wipples the audience you can see it is more than 100 and uh, sorry more than 1000 61 from more than 55 countries this is one of the largest virtual platforms happening in the world and we give uh, the videos in the youtube channel of senadipin education foundation all the 25 webinar videos are available in the uh, youtube channel of senadipin education you can watch it free and today we have two eminent people in the field of ga surgery dr ajay choudhury doesn't need any introduction at all because for the sake of formality i like to introduce him he is going to talk on the continuing challenge of leaks following wipples procedure he already made a uh, lecture uh, about anastomotic leak but that was not complete because of the time so this time you will uh, we will be hearing from him the continuing challenge of leaks following wipples procedure other choudhury sir all you know uh, uh, has done the highest number of wipples in india he has got almost 40 years of experience in this field and he was instrumental in starting the first gis of the department in india in gb pan hospital and you can uh, hear from himself other choudhury I am the chairman of the Department of Gastrointestinal Surgery, Gastrointestinal Oncology, and Bariatric Surgery at Medanta Medical City Hospital. And uh, we have a long association. Actually, he handpicked me to the national uh, scenario way back in 2009 or 2010. <clears throat> he is a mentor to many mentors. He is a jovial person, eloquent speaker, loved to discuss practical issues. he was office wear of many associations he was the past president of iisg and he conducts a session in asa which is 
almost full with the uh, the hall more than 2000 audience will be there uh, for his session and uh, for moderating we have dr sudeep shah who is a consultant gastroenterology surgery uh, he is associate editor in journal of uh, surgery council member of aps bva he is co chair of ethics committee tata memorial hospital mumbai he is the academic face of many scientific organizations before uh, giving the mic to the uh, moderator let me ask all the participants to mute their mic on entry please acknowledge your uh, name by renaming your device participants logging from outside india are requested to reveal their their identity in the chat box raise your hand if you want to intervene everybody will be given permission to unmute their mic if they want to speak and please hide your video while professor adil chaudhary is presenting because the clarity of video will be more when uh, you hide your videos so please hide your video while the speaker is presenting next week we have dr surya ban balarao from pune to talk about organ preservation and periambular tumor a much less uh, talked uh, lecture and you can contact me regarding the webinar videos and uh, the fellowship programs at senadipan@gmail.com over to the moderator dr sudeep shah for moderating we can take over the proceedings dr sudeep thank you dr baiju for that fantastic introduction and congratulations on this tremendous worldwide educational forum that you have started so we have professor adarsh choudhury and uh, don't be belied by his young looks he is carrying the creases of 40 years of pancreatic surgery on his face and if you haven't had leaks you've just not done enough operations and adarsh has certainly done enough operations so who better to tell you how to take the ship to safety without much ado professor adarsh choudhury thank you sudeep can you hear me yeah okay oh, okay uh it's a pleasure being here again thank you bachu and i think you're doing a great job and today it's very easy for me because i have a better pancreatic surgeon than me who's the moderator sudeep so i'm very comfortable so it'll be pleasure sharing my thoughts and my beliefs with him uh my talk is basically going to be about pancreatic le uh, leaks in patients undergoing pancreatic duodenectomy why should we discuss post operative pancreatic fistula needless to say all of us who do pancreatic surgery we know that if there's one thing which kills these patients it's a pancreatic leak and pancreatic juice we all know is inert but once it gets mixed with intestinal juices the combination is lethal it causes intra abdominal abscesses they erode strouting structures there is bleeding and the pancreatic leak is the leading cause of death in pancreatic surgery patients need to stay in the icu obviously the length of stay is increased patients who develop complications have a higher degree of readmission because they have residual abscesses they have wound problems they have other issues and the hospital expenses in these patients go significantly higher i will discuss this topic in four main headings first i will discuss the problems of definition of a post operative pancreatic fistula then i'll talk a bit about can we prevent the formation of a post pancreatectomy pancreatic fistula can we reliably predict that this patient will develop a fistula once we are doing a pancreatic duodenectomy and then the management problems in these patients 
<clears throat> before 2005, the, there were at least 26 definitions of pancreatic fistula, which meant that if you had a single patient and you put this definition, the incidence of pancreatic fistula will range from 10% to 30%. So that just goes to prove that it was so difficult to compare the results between two surgeons and two centers because we really are not talking the same thing. So to sort this problem, there was a group which got together and defined the pancreatic fistula is any measurable volume of drain fluid after postoperative day three with an amylase content greater than three times the upper normal serum value. So this is the first time some effort was made to define what a pancreatic fistula is. And also it included uh, the three grades of pancreatic fistula. Grade A was a biochemical fistula that you have a patient who's got a drain. The drain is draining amylase rich fluid. So this was labeled as a grade A fistula. Grade B was labeled as a patient who had pain, fever, leukocytosis, need for antibiotics, somatostatin on its analogs, need for percutaneous drainage. And a grade C fistula was labeled as a fistula which needed a major change in management. Now, though this definition was a major milestone in pancreatic surgery, but it had its problems. The first issue was that this definition and the grading was from a methodological point of view flawed because it was not based on validation on any actual population of patients. Rather, it was only the result of a consensus obtained by the ex expert pancreatic surgeons where it was more eminence-based than evidence-based. Second, over years, surgeons realized that dividing into a grade A fistula is irrelevant because these patients had the same post-operative course as patients who had no fistula. And also, since there was a trend not to use drains routinely, so grade A fistula could not be measured. Also, over years, we are using more and more interventional drains to use to drain the collections inside the abdomen. In this classification, though the use of drain was mentioned in grade both B and C, in the text it was mentioned only for grade C. So that caused confusion. So there were some issues with the 2005 definition of the International Society Group of Study of Pancreatic Surgery. So based on this, there were problems and then surgeons started not using this classification. They were started, a new term came up as a clinically relevant post-operative pancreatic fistula. Uh, there was no uh, official definition. So this entity became to be described more often and that necessitated the need for a fresh definition of pancreatic fistula, which came in 2016 and was published in the journal Surgery. Now, this is the original 2005 classification, which divided the pancreatic fistula into grade A, B, and C. And as you can see, that patients who had a grade A fistula were essentially uh, normal and nothing much needed to be changed. So when we had the 2016 definition, grade A was removed, and we only had patients who were in grade B or in grade uh, C. So. Uh, this definition had the benefit because it came nearly 10 years uh, uh, later after the first definition and more than about uh, uh, 30,000 patients had been undergone this surgery. And so it allowed uh, them to have a better definition and uh, uh, left less chances uh, for a biased interpretation. But we must understand and realize that though this uh, definition is brief, it is simple, and it's clinically uh, applicable, it can only be applied 
after a fistula has developed. So this is not for prediction, but it only tells you that the fistula has developed. So what has been the impact of this newer classification on pancreatic fistula? The impact has been that now nearly 90 to 95% of pancreatic fistulae have been put into grade B. And grade B has become a heterogeneous group, which includes patients who need drains, which might be placed either radiologically, endoscopically, patients who need prolonged antibiotics, patients who need somatostatin analogs, need for nutritional support, blood transfusions, angiographic embolizations. They all have been included into grade B. So grade B has become a big group. And this fact was also realized in this paper that uh, uh, given the broad variety of uh, management uh, 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 of patients in grade B, there is a great degree of clinical heterogeneity. So this large institutional study demonstrated that uh, post-operative pancreatic fistula grade B is a heterogeneous entity. And these authors try to divide the grade B fistula uh, into three distinct subclasses. Uh, B1, they said, is a patient who just has a persistent drainage, no fistula treated, treatment is needed. B2 are patients who need pharmacological treatment. And B3 are patients uh, which need intervention, but non-surgical treatment. Uh, this classification, though not fully acceptable, has the uh, potential for implications for uh, an accurate reporting, possibly a comparative research, and better performance evaluation. And, and these results might uh, uh, be uh, used better in comparing the results in the near future. Uh, in 2017, uh, Petrozoli published this article in an attempt to find out what are the factors which may be responsible for the development of a pancreatic fistula. Because if we have to prevent a fistula, first we need to understand what a fistula is caused by. So he could find about, about 17 factors which have been discussed in literature which might possibly cause the development of a post-operative pancreatic fistula after pancreatic adrenectomy. Evidence for each of them is very variable. So some have been proven, but majority of them have been not been validated in large studies. So if somebody asks me, how do you prevent a pancreatic fistula? There is no one definite answer, but it's a group of things you do preoperatively you should tell patients to stop smoking there is some evidence that patients who smoke have a higher incidence of uh, uh, pancreatic fistula because it believed that the blood supply in pancreas in these patients is not very good there's a concept of prehabilitation in cancer patients who are given aggressive protein nutrition and exercise there is some evidence that it enhanced nutritional support over a longer period can possibly decrease uh, the chance of a pancreatic fistula. We all have experienced patients who undergo new adjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy. In these patients, the chances of development of pancreatic fistula is lesser. The pancreas gets fibrosed. And if you are a believer of using somatostatin and its analogs to decrease pancreatic secretion, it should start in the perioperative period. Definitely, there are things you can do during surgery. Uh, if you give less fluids, a goal-directed fluid therapy, there is evidence that if you do not lose blood, decrease blood transfusions, it decreases the chance of a pancreatic fistula. And as all we know as surgeons, technique is of paramount importance. A well-constructed pancreatic anastomosis usually does not leak. I will not say never leaks. Usually it does not leave. And post-operatively, there is emerging evidence that early removal of uh, drains and, and adherence to enhanced recovery pathways possibly decreases the chance of a pancreatic fistula. So I'm already giving you an answer that you'll ask me questions. Is pancreatic or better than pancreatic or gastrostomy? The answer is there is no evidence. 
There is no evidence that the use of an isolated loop is better. Is duct to mucosa better? Is dunking better? Is a transanastomotic stent necessary? Should somatostatin analogs be used routinely? Any role of fibrin silence? The answer to them, all of these questions, is no convincing evidence that one is superior to others. There are some of my beliefs which I think uh, go to prevent pancreatic fistula. You look at this picture, this shows a dilated pancreatic duct. The pancreas is firm. And if you do a pancreatic anastomosis in this patient, it might leak still. You know why? Because I believe that the pancreatic stump must be adequately mobilized. And if you ask me my tricks to uh, intraoperative tricks to decrease the chance of a pancreatic leak is very well summarized in this slide. You see there is absolute hemostasis. There is no bleeding. I've completely removed the uncinate process because it's, it's, a, it's our belief that if you leave the uncinate process there, there's a collection there. And if there's a collection and you do a pancreatic or jejunostomy, it might erode into there. The pancreas is well mobilized. There is no bleeding. And a well mobilized pancreas allows you to construct a good pancreatic jejunostomy. Our preference is to do a ductum mucosa anastomosis. We'll use at least eight sutures of 4 or 5 OPDS, three in interior wall, three in posterior wall, and two on the sides. That's the way we do this anastomosis. And in the end, this is what the anastomosis looks like. Our preference is to do a two layer interrupted anastomosis with pancreatic jejunostomy without using any trans anastomotic stent. In the situation that we cannot find the pancreatic duct, which occasionally happens because all our surgery is done with 2.5x magnification loops, we'll use an side to end anastomosis using 4 OPDS interrupted sutures and uh, 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 without leaving any uh, stem. To say that my anastomosis is better makes no sense. All anastomosis work equally well. You should perfect a technique. No one technique is good for every patient. You have to change the technique according to the degree of dilatation of the pancreatic duct and the texture of the uh, pancreatic parent chyma. Uh, Kawai published this article in Annals of Surgery, and he showed that uh, patients who had early removal of drain, early he meant by post-operative day four, the chances of developing a clinically relevant post-operative pancreatic fistula was statistically lesser than patients uh, who had the late removal of drains, as was the incidence of intraabdominal abscesses, because we all know that drains are help helpful, but they have their own side effects. And there's a belief that if you leave drains for a longer time, they can cause erosion and lead to development of the pancreatic. So if you ask me what are the prevention strategies to uh, for a pancreatic fistula, I will say during a resection, uh, do adequate clearance, avoid ischemic injury, there should be no bleeding, avoid blood transfusion, and there should be an optimal management of the pancreatic remnant. And there is convincing evidence that pancreatic duodenectomy done in high volume centers is associated with a lesser chance of pancreatic leak. You see this slide, see this patient, this patient has all the bad uh, has all the bad things. The pancreas is soft. The duct is posteriorly placed. There's hardly any parenchyma posteriorly. So anastomosing this duct needs a lot of experience. And if you if you are early in your career and you get this sort of a pancreatic stump, then I think the, there is disappointment. So centralization of services makes you realize because you become a high volume center a condition like this, when the pancreas is steatotic, you see this patient was an obese patient, he had diabetes, and steatotic pancreas has a very high propensity for leaking. So you must take adequate precautions. So surgery done in high volume centers is helpful in patients who have a bad pancreas, and, and that's why the results in these centers are better. Do you ever think that why have preventive strategies not worked? People have used falciform ligament. Some people use 
Trans anastomotic stents, people use octreotide, pelcinotide. Why has it not worked? What is wrong? We need to know that knowledge comes in two forms. One is constant facts, other is changing facts. Like the fact, the constant fact is that the sun rises in the east. The constant fact is that pancreatic cancer is lethal. Changing facts are the changing temperature in the world. The population is changing. There is a new term called as mesofacts. Mesofacts are facts which change very slowly. We don't even realize that they are changing. These are the facts that we thought are fixed, but they slowly change over our lifetime. Formation of a pancreatic fistula is a mesofact. We believe it is caused by a mechanical disruption of the anastomosis. Now we are realizing most of us who do pancreatic surgery have seen that our best anastomosis also leak. There is evidence appearing now that sometimes this is caused by the development of post-operative pancreatitis. This paper which came from Sydney group published in 2018 brought out a concept of saying that if you measure the amylase concentration during the time of surgery, it correlates with the development of a post-operative pancreatic fistula. And further study in these patients showed this density of sinus cells at the cut margin was higher. So these authors have proposed a mechanism that when you have a high sinus cell density at the cut margin, so there is a development of pancreatic, postoperative pancreatitis because more fluid leaks, there's ischemia and gland manipulation which activates pancreatic enzymes and this post-operative pancreatitis leads to the development of a post-operative pancreatic fistula. So no wonder many times the things we do do not work because possibly we are addressing the wrong thing. We have to evaluate this possible mechanism of development of pancreatic fistula, take measures to control post-operative pancreatitis. So sometimes it seems that we have ladders against wrong walls. We have only addressed the mechanical part of the anastomosis and ignored that another pathology may be playing a part in the development of a fistula. An interesting question often debated, discussed, considered is that, is it possible to predict the development of a pancreatic fistula? For this purpose, basically thought has gone in three directions. One is the formation of scoring systems. Can we pre-operatively -eval uh, evaluate the pancreatic texture to find out that this pancreas is more pre to look? And there have been studies on the drain fluid amylase to find its relevance. So Mark Calry was published one of the first papers. Uh, uh, one, there are many other papers, but Calry's paper was uh, based on the fact that they believed that pre-operative uh, assess, risk assessment of a clinically relevant pancreatic fistula is inadequate and is not possible. So these authors believe that the best chance of prediction of a development of a pancreatic fistula is intraoperatively. And uh, these uh, authors gave a score to various factors that's a gland texture, what is the basic pathology, what is the pancreatic duct diameter, and what is the intraoperative blood loss. So when the score was zero, there was a 0% chance of a development of a pancreatic fistula. But as the score exceeded seven or nine, nearly 70 to 80% patients developed a pancreatic fistula. So this scoring system is readily learned, is used and has been used uh, in many studies. But to say that it is always true is not uh, a fact. Uh, this is another uh, interesting uh, study which came from the Samsung Medical Center, where they uh, uh, used, uh, where they aim to develop a new risk prediction platform for post-operative pancreatic fistula after pancreatic or using machine learning algorithms. 
artificial intelligence has come in a big way. Uh, this study uh, uh, collected variables for about 1,850 patients who underwent pancreatic neurectomy, and they analyzed 38 preoperative and intraoperative variables. Uh, the machine learning algorithms identified 16 risk factors, which I've listed in this slide, which were responsible for the possible development of the post-operative pancreatic fistula. And the authors divided these factors into uh, technically demanding factors and, and patients who had post-operative factors. So machine learning has also been used uh, to assess uh, the possible development of, uh, the, of a post-operative pancreatic fistula. Uh, there has been a considerable interest in prediction preoperatively by radiology, uh, either on a CT or on an MRI and even on an EUS uh, to predict the, the, the quality of the pancreatic parenchyma and predict the uh, development of a post-operative pancreatic fistula. And this interesting uh, Japanese study of 262 patients who underwent pancreatic duodenectomy showed that when you have the pancreas to visceral fat CT value more than uh, 0 0.4, there were high chances of a development of pancreatic leak. So there have been many such studies where uh, uh, radiology in the form of NR, uh, MRI or EUS elastography has been used to predict the uh, development of a pancreatic fistula. Uh, this is a meta-analysis of the value of uh, post-operative drain fluid, which uh, this meta-analysis showed that if you assess the post-operative drain fluid on post-operative day one, it is a reliable indicator of the development of a post-operative uh, pancreatic fistula. So this was a, a meta-analysis. Uh, it, th this is very easy. It makes a lot of sense to study it. Uh, but if you see the quality of the papers which were uh, uh, included in this meta-analysis, there were some problems that there was no uniform use of a cutoff value and the number of patients were not adequate. But all of us know that in a clinical experience also, in the first post-operative day, if you have a very high amylase in your drain, then you get alarmed that this patient might develop a pancreatic fistula. So it's interesting when I see the uh, value of drains that the post-operative drainage on day one, early removal of drains. So I classify the pancreatic surgeons based on drains into either routine drainers, non-drainers, selective drainers, early removers, late removers, selective removers, and unsure ones. Each one of their arguments. But as uh, things stand today, it appears that two or three, uh, 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 I won't say fact, two or three uh, things come out. One is that uh, routine drainage is not necessary. You should put drains definitely in high-risk patients, but in patients whom you are think that the risk of pancreatic fistula is low, routine drainage is not recommended. Second, if you put a drain, you better remove it early. There's an interesting study which also showed that despite knowing this, that early removal is safer, most surgeons still persist with keeping the drain longer because, as I always say, it is not that surgeons don't learn new things. We don't forget old ones. So early removal of drains is better. And uh, I, I definitely believe that if you have a bad pancreas, somebody who's got a steatotic pancreas, it's better to put two or three drains, but putting drains in every single patient it's my uh, uh, belief that it's unnecessary. The problem with us is we need to understand that all these models and predictive models are only predicting the risk of development of a fistula, not the development of a fistula. There's a subtle difference between two, two things. The difference between the risk and the actual event happening. If I say that tomorrow is going to rain, is different from what I'm saying that tomorrow there are high chances of rain. So we need to differentiate between these two things. And many times I ask myself a question, okay, even if I predict that this patient is going to develop a fistula, how is it going to make me more careful? I'm anyway careful. 
So I'm watching for these things. So this question also goes up for a guess. What additional thing you can do if you suspect this patient has got a high chance of a development of a fistula? Now we come to the controversial and difficult to address the question, how to manage a clinically relevant post-operative pancreatic fistula? To my mind, there are, it, it has three parts. The most important part is to suspect the development of a pancreatic fistula. And once you suspect it, proving is not difficult, and then you have to intervene. Many times in the post-operative period, so this is the biggest problem that we do not diagnose a pancreatic fistula in time. In this condition, there's a window of opportunity. If you do not intervene, then things get late. And no matter what you do, these patients don't do well. So you need to have a heightened sensitivity to the presence of a clinically relevant postoperative pancreatic fistula, and you must react when there's a signal, but not when there's a noise. If we have progressive abdominal pain in a patient who undergoes pancreatic odinectomy, patients who have dyspnea, tachycardia, fever, delayed gastric emptying, pleural effusion, this patient has got postoperative pancreatic fistula. Generally, if the trajectory of recovery in a patient who undergoes Whipple's is not usual by day three or four, if patient is not moving around, has delayed gastric emptying, looks sick, it's time to get a CT scan. Of course, if you have hemorrhage from the Riles tube or the drain, you need to be very, very careful. Watch this patient carefully, ask for a CT angiogram, and literature suggests that most postoperative pancreatic fistulae are diagnosed on postoperative day six. When I was a kid, I used to watch this movie, The Uncle Agents, two of them, and this is a very sensible statement. They are surrounded by 20 gunmen, and Napoleon Solo asks his colleague, are you scared? And his colleague says, I'm always worried people who are not scared when they ought to be. So when you do a pancreatic odorinectomy on the third post-operative day, the abdomen is distended, there is tachycardia, there is higher IL tube aspirate, patient doesn't look well, then there is a definite problem. And the biggest mistake you can do in these patients is to ask for an ultrasound and rely on some vague investigation. These patients do not need surrogate markers of development of pancreatic fistula. The investigation of choice is to do a contrast enhanced, to do a CT scan, be it contrast enhanced or plain. If it shows nothing, patient doesn't get well, you again do a scan, image, image, image. That's the most important thing in these patients. We have a saying in our department that anything that goes wrong in a patient who undergoes pancreatic odorinectomy, it's a pancreatic leak. Even if the patient has a peronychia, it's a pancreatic leak. And those of you who see this slide carefully will have noticed one thing. I wish it was a live forum. This is not a usual slide. This is a pancreatic odinectomy in a patient who's got a situs inversus. You can see the pancreas is on the other side. The PJ normally looks the other way around. So anything that goes wrong in it, many times I've seen patients who undergo pancreatic odinectomy have a cardiac dysarrhythmia. We ask the cardiologist to look. It's not a cardiac issue. This patient has intra-abdominal sepsis you need to rule it out. So the management principles of a post-operative pancreatic fistula are to accurately and very early do an imaging and repeat it if the patient doesn't get well. Aggressively control election, uh, the, all the collections inside the abdomen. And in a minority of patients who do not get well, you might have to intervene surgically, but remember surgical intervention is associated with the high mortality. This is a very interesting, informative, and worth reading multi center retrospective propensity matched cohort study, which came from nine centers in the, of which participate, who participated in the Dutch pancreatic cancer group. This study uh, included 309 patients with severe pancreatic fistulae, uh, which were between 2005 and 2013. The primary endpoint of this study was 
to study the in-hospital mortality. And the secondary endpoint was to study the new onset organ failure. And this study showed that a step-up approach, which means that initially try percutaneous aspiration in patients with severe fistula, try to drain collections, works better than taking, undertaking these patients for surgery. The, answer, the, the reason is when you do a percutaneous drainage and it is effective, it does not induce collateral damage. And once you can take away all the secretions out, most of these patients will do well. This is an interesting paper which showed that manipulation from the surgically placed drains, either to do a fistulography or to put additional drains or to do lavage can also be helpful in patients who have clinically relevant post-operative pancreatic fistula. We all know as pancreatic surgeons, like Sudeep said, that the wrinkles on my face tell me that I have had my own problems and my friend during the management is an intervention radiologist. If you really want to do regular pancreatic surgery, you need to have an expert in intervention radiology because you will have patients who have leaks and then you need aggressive drainage of collections. Nothing to beat a smart radiologist who can put properly sized, properly placed, properly timed drains. God forbid, if you have aneurysms from your gastrodurnal artery or the hepatic artery, you need to embolize. These patients are catabolic. You need to insert feeding tubes and nothing helps you than an intervention radiologist. You have a condition, a patient who's bleeding and you have a radiologist who can put a stent across the hepatic artery or embolize this gastrodurnal artery. These procedures are life-saving because you don't have much time to intervene. So an intervention radiologist is God sent in such procedures. I'm often asked the question that if things don't go well, what do you do surgically? Surgically, you have to do debridement. You will nearly always have to detach the anastomosis if it's not already detached. Try putting an infant feeding tube into the pancreatic duct and bring it out. Do aggressive lavage. Put three or four or two or three big drains to drain the area. And you must always do a feeding jejunostomy because there's going to be a long battle. And these patients do not <clears throat> tolerate uh, uh, parental nutrition. So nutritional support is of extreme importance. How often you need to do a completion pancreatectomy? I hope and pray you don't have to do it because world over when you have to do a completion pancreatectomy, nobody has a large experience on this because I hope you don't have a large experience. The results of a completion pancreatectomy are not good. You will need to do it in a patient who has got extensive pancreatitis induced by the leak. There is bleeding from all around. Then you have no chance. And then you have to do a completion pancreatectomy. But these patients have majority of times poor outcomes. So the statement in Harry Potter is most relevant in patients who have clinically relevant pancreatic fistula that it's not our abilities that show who we truly are, it's our choices. What choices you make early, how early you intervene, how aggressively you drain these collections will determine outcomes. One of the tricks that you should do when you do a pancreatic duodenectomy is you should always do your hepatic duodenectomy a little away from your pancreatic duodenectomy because God forbid if you have a pancreatic leak and you have to fire a stapler, there should be an adequate amount of length of jejunum available so that you do not damage the hepatic jejunostomy. So leave at least 10 inches or 8 inches distance so you can at least fire a stapler to dismantle the pancreatic jejunostomy. What has been our experience? From March 2013 to October 2020, we did 671 pancreatic duodenectomies, and we have about a 7% rate of a pancreatic fistula. Fortunately, our rate of grade C fistula is less, and you might ask me the question, why is it so? I believe we do the tricks that we use, we are very, very concerned about not using blood transfusion during surgery. We restrict fluids. Our anesthetists know that 
We should do goal-directed fluid therapy. I am a great believer in aggressive mobilization of the pancreas. Pancreas is a very vascular structure. If your pancreas is well mobilized, you can push your jejunum right under it and good, good meticulous anastomosis. Many times when you are starting to doing pancreatic resection, once you finish the resection, you are so tired by the time you reach the anastomosis, it is not a bad idea to take a break or call a second group of surgeons who can do an anastomosis. And please, for God's sake, check your hemostasis before you start the reconstruction, because once the reconstruction starts, you will not be able to check for any bleeding. So take your time, do a meticulous anastomosis. Tell yourself that the fate of the patient is decided on the operation table. And there are situations when you should avoid anastomosis. If I do a pancreatic duodenectomy on a patient and I open up and I find there is extensive pancreatitis because of stent-induced so, uh, procedure, I will close that patient and come back again after six weeks. Anastomosing the jejunum to unhealthy pancreas is dangerous. And we've had many patients and we don't regret it. Like you are doing a pancreatic duodenectomy for a patient who's got trauma, complex duodenal injury. These patients are sick. They are coagulopathic. They have acidosis. You do a pancreatic duodenostomy in that situation, it is definitely going to leak. And this patient is not going to tolerate the leak. So if you have to do surgery, uh, whipples in this procedure, put an infant feeding tube into the pancreatic duct, exteriorize it. If the patient survives the procedure, come back after six to eight weeks or three months, and you can do a pancreatic duodenostomy. And there is evidence that if you follow enhanced recovery protocols, the degree of and chances of pancreatic leaks decrease. This is my last slide. I have a great faith in being a skeptic. I believe that most of us have the problem that we mistake our opinions for facts. Facts need a lot of validation. We should be skeptics. And all truths in the world are half-truths. Uh, this is my last slide. I'll be very happy to answer questions and uh, get input from Sudeep and Beju about whatever I've said. Thank you so much for your time. Wonderful, sir. Uh, crisp and clear as usual. So there will be a lot of questions from the uh, chat box and there are a lot of uh, 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 pancreatic surgeons uh, joined. Uh, the king of pancreatic surgery, Dr. HMS himself is there. Uh, Dr. R.S. Shastri is there, Dr. Sindhil Nadan is there, Dr. Shivaram is there, Prataban, AML, IFN, a lot of uh, uh, pancreatic surgeons are there in this platform. Um, please stay with us uh, for the questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Sudeep, you can take over. Right. So, fantastic talk as we always get from uh, you, Dr. Adarsh. So, there are many issues that you have pointed out, which are scientific, the literature, which is heterogeneous because this is a heterogeneous subject, very difficult to study. But we would love to tap your personal thoughts and personal experience because that's what really helps in these situations. So I would just like to kick off by asking you, uh, you mentioned prehabilitation briefly. So do you feel that reduces the leak or it increases the capacity of the patient to withstand the leak? And how exactly would you manage a patient who's traveled a long distance, is staying in Delhi at his own cost? And how much time would you spend on the prehabilitation versus getting him up on table early? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so the prehabilitation... If you ask me, the real sense is only possible in patients who are undergoing new adjuvant treatment because you have a window of say, 8 weeks, 12 weeks, or 14 weeks. What majority of times who patients who come to us have a window period of about 7 to 10 days. In that period, I really don't think it makes much of a difference. We try to give them, but it doesn't work. The only soft evidence comes in patients who have received new adjuvant treatment you have at least three months in them, putting them on an exercise re regime and high protein intake possibly has been associated in one or two studies that I know of, of a decreased chance of pancreatic leak, but it appeals to logic that possibly they are better 
equipped to handle the leak than decreasing the leak. But in 10, 12 days, I do not think that we get, you can really make a sizable difference in decreasing the chance of a leak. Right. So moving on to the drain, we've had a lot of discussion about, and you very beautifully philosophically stated the different types of drain handlers. Could you tell us in which patients you would not put a drain? How do you select the ones you put a drain in? And when exactly would you remove the drain? Because there's been a lot of criticism of yeah, the yeah. Y study you quoted. That's right. That's right. Saying that, you know, you see that the patient is fine, you pull out the drain, you leave the drain in and Obviously, this is the one who's likely to get complications. So this is a selection bias, which is intrinsic in the study. I so what you. is your personal policy and what are the tips you would like to give the audience? Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, in a line like this, there are no truths. There are half truths. I Absolutely. So my belief is that I do not routinely put a drain. I will put drain in situation number one, that first of all, if it's a patient beyond the age of 70 years, okay. If, if a patient has, my preference is to do a ductum mucosa anastomosis. If I cannot do a ductum mucosa, I will put a drain. If I use a blood transfusion, I will put a drain. If there has been an event on the operation table that there was a hypotension, I will put a drain. And if I see that this patient has got intra-abdominal abscess because of a, of a stent or something, then I will put a drain. In other, And this comes to about total of about 30% of our patients do not get a drain, 70% patients will get a drain. But right. uh, what is exactly happening these days is that I leave by the time the abdomen is closed and my colleagues always put a drain. So <laughs> it's not happening. So they believe they always find a reason for it. Your second question is very interesting. When do we remove the drain? Uh, we check the drain fluid amylase on day one and day three. If the patient's clinical condition is good, most of our drains will come out on day three, provided the drainage the amylase is not high and the drain volume is less than 300 cc. If the, if the amylase is high and the drain volume is more than 300 cc, then we take it on a day-to-day -day basis. Have I answered your question? So, Absolutely. Uh, would you like to tell us more about what type of drain you, you use uh, we and use where, a, where are they placed? Uh, uh, we always use a single drain. Uh, it's placed a tube drain in the right subhepatic uh, space. We, uh, under the hepaticojejunostomy, we put the, uh, the, the drain. A uh, lot of questions about suction drains, the silicon drain, the Jackson Pratt drain. Do you I, believe... I, I, uh, uh, suction drains are harmful because they produce negative pressure. So they are positively harmful. Apart from that, we, uh, the Jackson Pratt is a very good drain, but we don't get it in India. So uh, maybe we get it, but we don't get it. We don't use it. But uh, I think uh, the tube drains are easy to manage, but uh, none of the drain is ideal. The day we get an ideal drain, I think we should get a Nobel Prize because whenever I want a drain to work, it never works. It gets blocked. So we have, a, we have a problem with these drains. But uh, Sudeep, you'll agree that if I have a patient who's got a steatotic pancreas, I propose leaks, then I'll possibly put two or three drains because I'm very scared. It's more of my mental thing. But uh, uh, either I believe you should have two or three drains or you should have no drain. That's my belief. Right. Uh, and so, uh, before going go to the next question, uh, Dr. R.S. Uh, Shastri sir is there. Uh, sir, can you please uh, uh, unmute your mic? I cannot answer Dr. Shastri. is my teacher. So <laughs> I'll have to agree with him, no, whatever he says. Is there any question for me? I said I cannot answer your question because you are the teacher. I learned from no, you. No, no. I don't have any question. Is there any question for me? No, no, sir. You, you can comment and you can put question also. No, oh. so you can say it in the end whether yeah. others learn properly from you or not. That, that is that <laughs> yeah, is yeah. an important question. Yeah, that's my only point. And in a large gathering is um, about the question of drain. I know others is a little radical in not putting drain when. Uh, he thinks is not indicated, but uh, most of us would like to leave a drain, one drain. Uh, a lot of times it has helped when uh, we thought it would not help. We don't leave the drain too long. It, uh, it do a drain fluid MLS on the third day, and uh, if it is a little on the higher side, fourth or fifth day, and then remove the drain. If it is not high, remove it on the second day or third day itself. Um, at the other point which others raised, say when the, your 
pancreatic stump doesn't look too healthy. See, that's an important uh, area where say, the fistula is likely to develop. Under such circumstances, I don't attempt a duct to mucosa anastomosis. I always dunk them. I thought that would be safer when uh, your stump is not, doesn't look too healthy. Whether it's a uh, dunking into stomach or uh, jejunum, it depends on uh, how free the stomach or the jejunum is and how, you know, it's just a uh, ease of uh, doing. Uh, I don't have any particular preference. Uh, but I find uh, dunking into the stomach is much easier than uh, into the jejun. These are only a few comments I wanted to make. Please stay, sir. Uh, stay with us uh, till the end of the discussion. Uh, there will be po questions pointed to you also. Yeah, yeah, by all means. So, Dr. Adarsh, back to you again. So, we've heard this figure about three times more in the drain than in the serum. So how often do you do serum amylase post-operatively? And what is your uh, feeling about this concept of early post-operative pancreatitis? And uh, how would you defer it from a leak or are the two always associated? What are your thoughts on this concept? Uh, this is a very good question. And I must confess at the very beginning, I do not have a definite answer. But I am very convinced, Sudeep, that post-operative pancreatitis does occur. And it's a serious thing. And to my mind, I'm, uh, I am beginning to believe some of my vascular anastomosis have leaked. And I think there is something else happening which I do not understand. So post I always measure serum amylase post-operatively because I have lost a couple of patients of very good anastomosis. So I am tending to believe in this theory that post-operative pancreatitis possibly contributes to the development of a post-operative pancreatic system. And our efforts have been wrong. We have been totally working on the mechanical side of the anastomosis. We have to look at some other uh, uh, things. I am aware of a study where local installation of gabaxin mesylate decreased the chances of pancreatic leak, leak on an experimental basis. So there is some sense in this that it's not a purely mechanical phenomena. There is something else happening. So will your interpretation of the post-operative serum amylase change your ERAS pathway in these patients? Uh, theoretically right, but what actually happens is if the serum amylase continues to be high, these patients anyway become outliers for a ERAS protocol. They get, uh, they have ileus, they have other issues. So they, things go hand in hand with them. You'll agree with me in your Absolutely. experience. Your Absolutely. So, so you have come to know that the things don't match. The trajectory, everything is going high. Amylase, is, they can't be in a ERAS protocol because ERAS protocol only works when you have no complications. Yes. Once Absolutely. a complication occurs, and we use ERAS now as more as a marker for complication. Yeah. If a patient cannot eat by day four or five, you look, in your experience, or you would have realized something is amiss. Something is amiss. Absolutely. Uh, so going to a question which Dr. Shastri has raised, have you ever flirted with pancreatic or gastrostomy? I first, I, okay. Uh, you know, there are many questions which are based on biases. I have a strong bias against pancreatic or gastrostomy, and I very loudly see the term bias. Because I am not that good, some of anastomosis leak. My belief is if you have a pancreatic gastrostomy that leaks, the only result is disaster. Because stomach is a very vascular organ, it bleeds. So I initially in my career did, but now I don't do a pancreatic gastrostomy, I do a pancreatic jejunostomy. But I'm still saying, I know literature does not support me. You ask me a personal question, I will yeah. always do a pancreatic jejunostomy, and it works well in my experience. And I don't, if I ask me a single question is, pancreatic is a very vascular structure. I have not seen a, a ischemic pancreas in my life for a pancreatic duodenectomy. So I don't use those big hemostatic sutures. I think, I don't believe that paper by Strasbourg, we have to go back and cut. At least I have never needed to do that. I want your input on this. Absolutely. So uh, I think that's a, that's an interesting concept because the paper came up because CT scans of patients which leaked showed there was an area of necrosis. But we know that it is likely that the inflammation of the leak probably caused the necrosis, necrosis. rather than the other way around. So, I mean, he, he's a lateral thinker and he put up a theory. But I think most surgeons would agree with what you say. Uh, so coming to your technique, uh, you talk about mobilization of the pancreas. All of us do it. How would you tell a young surgeon that this is adequate mobilization? What would you consider adequate? 
Uh, that's a uh, very good question. I think uh, 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 my adequate, because I uh, believe that the pancreas should ride over the children. The pancreas, you should be able to put posterior sutures very comfortably. Because we do a two-layer anastomosis when we reduct to mucosa. Uh, then my mobilization, last time I showed a video, yes. I, said, I, I said five centimeters, not five centimeters. But I will mobilize at least three to five centimeters, and it's not difficult. It's very yeah. important because the pancreas has to fall over the jejunum, and you should be able to put your posterior sutures very carefully. So that's my answer to this. Because sometimes when you put the silk suture, it bleeds from the pancreas. Yeah. So you should have so much of space to manage that. You should not struggle. So if it, the jejunum goes right under the pancreas, that's my aim. Right. Uh, any special technique in cutting the pancreas? How would you handle this stuff? I, I use stuff? a diathermy because I have, I am, I'm, I'm convinced it doesn't harm. Whatever you use, I think these are the uh, reasons we give to mistakes we make elsewhere. We give it to diathermy and things like that. I don't think it makes a difference. Knife, diathermy, whatever you use doesn't make a difference. So I have always used a diathermy. So the key I would suspect is to get a flat surface, whatever technique Absolutely you... Absolutely flat surface. And also, uh, I may be wrong again on this, that if you have a bleeding from the pancreatic surface, it is much better to use fine proline sutures to yeah. uh, suture them rather than doing a big buzzing and trying to burn. Uh, any thoughts on, uh, we are moving into an era of minimal invasion, a lot of interest in robotic, laparoscopic. Do you think that these techniques in any way would either mitigate or increase leaks? Uh, there is, I don't do it. But the, the, uh, in the hands of uh, the good surgeons, the results are as equal, uh, as good or bad as open surgery. So you uh, feel that's really... Uh, uh, um, just for a while. Yeah. Professor Rajan Saxena, HOD, and uh, Professor of uh, STPG, Dr. who has joined. Uh, he, he wanted to make a comment. Uh, Dr. Rajan. Uh, Dr. Rajan, yeah. Dr. Rajan, can you hear me? Uh, I would like to make a comment about the about the extent of pancreatic mobilization for a good pancreatic jejunotomy. The policy that we adopt here is we mobilize the back of the pancreas till you are clearly able to see the junction of the splenic vein and the portal vein. And your cut surface of the pancreas has to be parallel to the ceiling. It should lift off in such a manner. It's facing the ceiling. When you do a pancreatic jejunotomy in this technique, what Arash was saying, that the jejunum should comfortably go back behind the pancreas and offer a buttress. This prevents some complications. If enough jejunum is there, the vessels are unlikely to get involved. And we are just now coming out with a report on analysis of 800 pancreatic jejunectomies, where the technique, what difference it's going to make to complications is going to be highlighted. It's coming out pretty soon. The, this is a single important factor is the extent of pancreatic mobilization. The second important thing is pancreas what is the level of cutting? An important factor in pancreatic jejunotomy. It should be a flat cut. No beveling here. If you do a posterior beveling on the cut surface of the pancreas, your anastomosis becomes that much more difficult to handle. Then in a flat cut, the technique of cutting, I cut it with cutting diathermy and use bipolar sparingly wherever it is required. That is not shown to have made a difference. We have tried three different techniques. I don't use harmonic for dividing the pancreas for sure. I do insist on a complete removal of the ancinate process. Sadash has very pertinently pointed out that this is an important fact. The picture he showed of bared portal vein is a very reassuring picture for the pancreatic surgeon that his complication levels would go down. The learning curve would be a smooth one there rather than an abrupt one with complications shooting up here and there. The third thing important to say here is the post-operative course is all deciding about how you should proceed with the patient. There are no definite hard and fast rules that I must remove it on day three, the drain, or I must keep it for day five. No. It is the outcome of the patient if the patient has no tachycardia. And even if the drain output is low, if the patient is not having hiccups, we have found a significant association of post-operative hiccups with collections when nothing else is giving you a suspicion that that is what is happening. There is a leak. And that leak will manifest in untold ways if you ignore it at this stage. So you have to chase the patient as he's faring and act accordingly. Very rightly said that ERAS protocol actually warns you when things are getting out of hand rather than 
preventing anything. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was a wonderful summary by Professor Saxena. All the points which Dr. Adarsh had brought out were very stated, crystal clear terms, uh, reiterated. Uh, Adarsh, back to you. Uh, if you've done a portal vein resection, uh, there's a lot of edema sometimes yeah. in the bowel. Uh, any yes. tips and tricks in that yeah. situation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a good question. So, Deep, all your questions are 10 out of 10. So the first common mistake, I, if I do a portal vein resection, I will never start a pancreatic jejunostomy immediately. I always take a break for 10 minutes because let edema settle. Because no matter, I am not very fast. It takes me at least 10, 15, 20 minutes to do it. So and you clamp it. And I don't routinely clamp the SMA. So if you do it, so I will always, and many times I will, in these patients, are on the side of adding a feeding jejunostomy also if the bowel is edematous. And I'll always put a drain uh, in these patients. Though, if you do a vascular anastomosis, you should avoid a drain. But in this situation, I will, uh, if, I, if I have slightest doubt, I will always put a drain. Because I think if you take a break majority of times, the edema settles. The mistake is that you immediately try to do the anastomosis. Uh, can, you please, uh, uh, can you please unmute your mic? Yeah, your mic is now unmute. Uh, uh, can you please test your mic? Hello? Uh, Sudhip, uh, you just carry on. Uh, his mic. Yeah. Uh, sir, sir, I can. I, I can. Uh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. I think there is some problem with his mic. Because, uh, uh, Doctor Adarsh, are you there or? Because uh, I think his picture is blanked out. Uh, uh, maybe we can take these two minutes, uh, you know, to discuss laparoscopic whipples. Who better than our host to <laughs> tell us any tips and tricks that you feel in a laparoscopic to avoid leak? Because this is an important subject. And maybe it's a repetition of your previous seminar. But Yeah, yeah. Actually, the, uh, the mobilization of the pancreas, uh, Dr. Adar said that um, there should be enough mobilization for the, uh, the pancreas. And the pancreas should be made stumpy to get a... Accommodated into the uh, jejunum, that is one thing. And we usually cut uh, the pancreas with the hormone scalpel because when you cut uh, with a uh, uh, there will be bleeding uh, that cannot be handled uh, laparoscopically itself. So we do uh, cut with the hormone scalpel, but when the duct comes, uh, that will be cut with the scissors. So, uh, majority of the uh, uh, laparoscopic cables, uh, pancreatic surgeons are doing uh, the same only. And uh, the anastomosis, uh, initially we started with the pancreatic gastrostomy because of the, uh, the lie of the stomach over this one. Now we changed to pancreatic genostomy uh, and uh, we do duct mucosa most of the cases, almost 90% of the cases we do duct mucosa two layer anastomosis. Dr. Sendhil Nathan also is there in this audience. Uh, We'll be having something to say before that. Uh, uh, go to uh, Dr. Ramesh, I can see, has very politely put up his hand. <laughs> sir, uh, you can go ahead, sir. Uh, Dr. S. Ramesh. Uh, Dr. Ramesh, are you with us or? Uh, is others available? I'm there, sir. I'm very much there. I'm sitting, waiting for I, you. I, no, I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, ask you about this entity of post-operative pancreatitis. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Very clearly. I, yeah. yeah. So, uh, the point is that, you know, uh, you have either, uh, you know, fear mammalase and drain amylase increase. Sometimes you, you get only drain amylase increase and the theory that was given was that if you had serum amylase increase as well, then this could well be post-operative pancreatitis. Is that the current understanding or is there more to it than that? It is not very clear because what is only clear is based on that one study that belief was that, that it's not only mechanical, which is there. It's not been yes, 
decided that what is the serum mileage level to decide what is drain flow mileage. Patients, they, they, this study, you also know it, was based on the two factors that they studied, was the density of the sinus cells in the uh, pancreatic cut margin, and the intraoperative, they, they assess the amylase in the perioperative field. So they found out that patients in whom the sinus cell density was high, there was an increased uh, local amylase in the operative field, and it translated with a higher chance of post-operative pancreatic fistula. So they, it's a theory that possibly that there are some patients who have a greater chance of developing pancreatitis because of increased density of sinus cells uh, during pancreatic odontic. This is the theory to say that what's the, um, uh, the correlation with the drain amylase, serum amylase, this has not been evaluated as yet. Adarsh, uh, my biggest problem, as I understand it, is whether they are your uh, cases, or Sudeep's, or mine, or Baiju's, the amylase levels in the drain do not always mean trouble. It only means trouble in about a half the cases. In 50% of the patients, you have high amylase, but nothing seems to happen. That's very well proven, you know, this pancreatic so, gray day. That's therefore, why this... therefore, the amylase level is a surrogate marker of the secretory ability of the pancreas. That's all. Mm -hmm. So in it could even be a surrogate marker of the acinar content of the pancreas. Mm -hmm. So I, I teach residents that it, by the time you mobilize the acinar process off, if you find a lot of telltale white tissue, uh, white flakes in the pancreatic area, it's often a sign of a high secreta. And uh, so this is this would be a, a, a a starting point of a harbinger of trouble, if you like. But as a relative factor, you still you have anastomosis which is coming in, and if it works, none of this will matter. So I'm not really able to understand your concept that th this will change the approach to the anastomosis or to change our understanding of the anastomosis. I think not. I think it, obviously there is an entity where despite all the best efforts, you still can get complications, but that doesn't sort of give you a new entity as far as, far as I, I could understand. Uh, so uh, I, I, need your, I need your clarification on this subject. First of all, it's not my theory. Secondly, it's what I'm reporting from the literature and I, all things are not absolutely mechanical. We are beginning to realize that intestinal anastomotic leak we never could think that the intestinal microflora influence intestinal leak. If you talk five years from, uh, from earlier, we would have never believed that. So to say that this is absolute nonsense is not true. There might be some sense in it. It might be contributory. I'm not saying it is my theory, but it certainly is a pointer that it is not totally mechanical because I'm very convinced that some of my best anastomoses have leaked. So there is something else playing which we do not understand. And this might be something, I'm not saying it is the answer, but it might be one of the contributive factors and it's too soon to accept it and to dismiss it, but it is worth knowing that something like this is happening. So I think we can agree that this is an evolving concept. It's something that we need to study further. This would be a very interesting yes, debate for yes. the next IHPBA meeting. And, no, no, uh, I mean, it's, it, these, these things take years to understand. Absolutely. They, you know, we need thought starters. It might be to say that it's absolutely wrong or absolutely right is unfair. We need to have an open mind that it absolutely. might happen, it might not happen, but it exists. I, I asked Murray Brennan in a discussion that do you think that the pancreatic anastomosis is as good in open as in laparoscopic? He gave a very beautiful answer. He said, I can't do it, but there are people who can do it. So there, it might be there, it might not be there. That's what I'm saying. So moving to a related issue, we skimmed over the somatostatin analogs. Uh, would you like to elaborate on your policy? Uh, I am, uh, I'm, first of all, my policy is not to use them majority of times, but in a desperate patient who's leaking, I will use it. But I know that the data is very soft uh, for somatostatin, for peserotide. And actually there is also a 
a Finnish study which compares hydrocortisone with pesarotide yeah. and said hydrocortisone is equally good or bad. So yeah. the data is soft, but in people believe for high risk patients, low volume centers, it might be of use. But to say it's the standard of care is not true. So you do not use it I don't do perioperatively it. for any patient? No. We don't use it for any patient. Post-operatively, supposing you've had a drain in and you found your day three drain amylase was 60,000. No, I will you, not use it. You will not start it? I will not start it. And but, uh, but hydro- I, 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 I But I will also say that uh, uh, not absolutely sometimes I will start it, but somebody whom I'm operating who's got a grade C fistula, I will start it because I'm desperate. So that's what I'm saying. You might ask why not in that, in that patient, but I'm being very honest with you because then I would cover anything that it works, but it's not routinely used. So that is with the prayer to God level of evidence, you That's will right. start That's the... Right. Uh, what is your belief? What is your belief? No, I, I would entirely agree with you. In fact, uh, the, we had a literature review before. This is not the forum for it. But the evidence is exceedingly weak. Even the so-called level one trials, which have been published, have multiple flaws within them. So my policy is exactly the same as, as yours. And it is given more in faith than with absolute That's science. Absolutely. As, as, as evidence. Uh, maybe we could now move on to the post-operative issues that we are facing. So you have a patient with delayed gastric emptying, day four, um, you know, you're unable to feed the patient. You do a CT and there is a five centimeter collection. And usually it is behind the pancreas next to the portal vein in the least accessible area. And the interventional radiologist is a little plus minus. How aggressive are you? about uh, draining these collections. Okay, if the patient just has delayed gastric emptying, I will not be very aggressive. If this patient also has tachycardia, is dyspneic, his urine output is falling, uh, he has a pleural effusion, so then I will be more aggressive in that. Mere presence of delayed gastric emptying is not a good thing. Uh, we just did a rough estimate in our patients who had uh, collections which are significant. We realized when you have three things, any three things, maybe delayed gastric emptying, leukocytosis, tachycardia, oliguria, pleural fusion, any of these two, three things, then things get bad. In one, I may not be very aggressive. Just a simple delayed gastric emptying, five centimeter collection, patient otherwise moving around, just high rise tube aspirate, I will sit on him. Another patient is associated with tachypnea, as tachycardia, I will be more aggressive in getting it drained. Because in my life, the, the, uh, problem of post-operative recovery is not linear. Yeah. It, is, it is very Brownian. I just don't know there is any rule of thumb, but we have to see things in totality. Uh, how often would your interventional radiologist fail to get in a drain in, in the situation where you want it drained? Uh, we are very fortunate. Our intervention radiologist, one of, I'm sure you also have. Absolutely. But, yes. So uh, our intervention radiologist is very, very good. We are very fortunate and he's got us out of trouble very often. But if he cannot do it, he will not do it. But if he does it, he will do it. So the patient is wobbling in spite of drainage, one drain, there's maybe a small undrained collection. So how do you decide on the threshold of repeated drainage, escalation of antibiotics versus a relaprotomy? Uh, so are I'm... your indications for relaprotomy going down? Do you have a high threshold, low threshold? Our indications for relaprotomy are significantly decreased. Because in our experience, whenever we had to reoperate the patients, nearly 85% of them will die. We had significant mortality in patients in whom we had to operate. Our uh, basic threshold is to image them very aggressively and very aggressively get drained by sometimes. There is no cookbook answer to this that you yeah. should put two drains, four drains. A patient, to my mind, the ominous sign is bleeding. If you angioembolize and the bleeding does not stop, then there is no point in waiting. Then you have to operate these patients. But if it is just drainage sepsis oriented, I will be reluctant to operate these patients. And majority of times you can manage. And I also believe that these drains need to be managed very well because they have a tendency to get blocked. So you have to irrigate them well. You need to be constantly watching these patients. Uh, I think Dr. Thomas Verghese had a question. So would you please go ahead. You can unmute, Dr. Verghese. Yeah, 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 unmuted. Yeah. Uh, did you want to ask something? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, I think uh, Dr. Adarsh, this is a beautiful presentation, very philosophical as usual, and uh, excellent. Thank you. But sir. my, uh, you have brought in many points, but the points I would like to ask to one, uh, to one comment and two questions. Number one, you mentioned that uh, there are ways by which you will try to prevent uh, a leak. This also in involves the texture of the pancreas. And if you find that it is not, or you will know by perioperatively that there's a possibility that this patient can develop a leak. Am I right? No, I never said that. What I'm saying is that if I... No, I, soft, soft, I mean soft pancreas or friable pancreas when you are dissecting such things, possibility. Am I right? Uh, yes, sir. Then if there are soft and friable, you cannot change that. So, because we cannot, the, some things can't be changed in a patient, like the basic disease, texture of pancreas, degree of dilatation. But, but you have, you already committed, you already cut the pancreas. So yeah, 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 yeah. How will, yeah, you, yeah. How will yeah. you prevent the possibility of a leak in such <laughs> cases? <laughs> sir, that's, I wish I was that good to prevent I am just an ordinary human being. But so, still, you are committed. Okay, I'm telling you. you. No, no, I, I will. No, no. We all go through it. We all do that. What I'm saying is that if if there's a situation like that in this patient, like I normally don't put a drain in this patient, I will put two drains. But still, even my dispatched efforts, it will still leak. So I will do all the gimmicks available to me to prevent a leak. But I will not be always. The idea why I asked the question is: Will you change your anastomosis from a duct to mucosa to a dunking procedure. No, no, no. I don't. Or, so, or I a technique will no. change to prevent no, no. it. No, no. I have uh, only two procedures. If the duct is visible, I will do a duct to mucosa anastomosis. If the duct I cannot identify, then I'll do an end to side single layer anastomosis. Okay. Number two, uh, I, there are so many, as uh, uh, Dr. Shah has said, there are so many uh, among the group who will be doing laparoscopic or robotic sure, sure, sure. or open surgery. Sure, sure. Is there any comparison between these three techniques in expert hands as to the rate of uh, this complication? Sir, the, uh, all these three techniques are equally good in the hands of the experts. None is, uh, there is no inferiority with the laparoscopic or robotic. They are as good as open. Or robotic? Yeah, yeah as good as Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, Dr. Sudeep, we can take the questions from the chat. Yes, uh, Dr. Narwar, yeah. Hi. Yeah. 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 You're on. Yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. Just wanted to ask uh, Dr. Chaudhary. I learned, uh, I should do technique from him almost 25 years back. And I practice it till now, but I recently learned that he stopped doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped doing. I stopped doing it, uh, uh, Dr. Narwaria, because earlier I used to believe that if you use an isolated loop for the pancreatic anastomosis, it's a pure pancreatic fistula. But later, when some of my leaks occurred, I realized it was not a pure fistula. They had the same problems, so I realized I was losing a length of the small bowel also. And now there are many trials, which, and we published it also. An isolated loop is no guarantee against any safety of a pancreatic loop. You add more to the surgery, you have get problems. I don't do it now. <laughs> because uh, me being a laparoscopic surgeon, I don't do open surgery now. Even pancreatic rhinectomy, I do laparoscopic. And to do a ruin by an osmosis is a 20-minute job by us. So I still prefer to do it. And uh, we can feed them early, just like our um, pancreatic experience. We feed them... Uh, on day one and day two. So the early feeding definitely improves and recovery is much, much faster. That but is what I feel. Dr. Maria, we also feed our patients on first post-op day. The rile strip is removed on first post-op day and most of start oral sips. But it's a belief you do. I and mean, like I always said, I, I, I only gave a disclaimer. The answer is no. There's no difference. You can do whatever you want. You need to have your faith and not too much of faith in what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. You're most welcome. Uh, Carmen, uh, from Calicut, uh, he has done a lot of uh, open uh, Whipple's procedures, more than 500. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, Hi, hello, sir. I, 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 have, I have a basic question to ask. What is the mechanism of healing of pancreatic anastomosis? Because we discussed about inflammation in almost all healing. And you said pancreatitis is a, an important risk factor for uh, pancreatic anastomotic disruption. 
So, what is the mechanism of healing? Is it by formation of inflammation, formation of a small pseudocyst and rupture of pseudocyst into the duct? Because we are making some adherent pancreas to the jejunum or stomach, whatever area we have. Because doing a duct mucous anastomosis, the caliber of duct is not fitting to the uh, caliber of the uh, jejunal mucosa. So we still believe that it will heal by first intention. And that is the uh, problem happening uh, when there is a leak. That is one thing uh, I wanted to clarify. I am not sure what uh, you are uh, trying to say because I do not have an answer to the question. But if you do the CT scan following pulse. majority of patients have some degree of collection around the pancreatic jejunostomy. Now, what is it? Because I do not know. But why should the healing here be different from elsewhere in the body? But one thing we forget many times is that the pancreatic duct has no muscle. The pancreatic juice just drips like a tap. So if we do the anastomosis properly, the pancreas should be placed higher than the jejunum. So the hole falls into the jejunum. This is an important thing. We forget that whether it occurs by, I do not know. It, I think some leaks must be occurring, but majority of them are harmless. And uh, I think the healing will be the same elsewhere in the abdominals. I see no reason why uh, it should be different. Uh, when the, no, when there is a mild form of pancreatitis, which all, uh, we see you have an ampullary tumor, even without stenting, sometimes you will see pancreatitis in the pancreas. So in those situations, when you do pancreatic odonectomy, I find it easier to make anastomosis rather than difficult. Only when there is a severe form of pancreatitis, we have problem with pancreatic anastomosis. I, actually, I have, the other way, I have the other way around of saying it. I always say that surgery for periampillary cancer is more difficult because though the outcome is good, the pancreas is soft. In CA pancreas, the outcome is bad, but the anastomosis is easier because the duct is... The, the, the gland is more fibrotic because if you see the pancreatic tumor induces desmoplasia. Desmoplasia is a good thing and a bad thing also. It's a good thing for the surgeon because pancreas become more fibrotic. It tails sutures matter. And it's bad because it prevents chemotherapy for reaching there. And it's been conclusively proven that the degree of fibrosis is related to leaks. No, pancreatic cancer. So that's a very interesting theoretical discussion. But before, you know, I think we are, uh, the time is yep. Uh, yep. running out. Uh, a few practical questions a man of your seniority can help us with. Oh my God. Is, you know, how handling the patient and the relatives. Yeah, yeah. Pre op, post op. So when you consent them, do you tell them about leaks, the rates, yeah. and post operatively? At what stage do you tell them the drain amylase is high and there is trouble and how do you handle that? That's a very, very important question. And I think we have never been taught this in our training. This is the sad part of our surgical training that we have never taught communication. And we have to learn it on our own by hits and misses. Swing and miss approach does not work. So I have had a lot of problems. So now I talk, okay, come to the point. I tell patients who come to me that there is a, two to three percent chance of a mortality after this procedure. I tell them that I cannot select who are the patients. I do, I say that I do 100 operations a year and two or three of them will die. I do not know which one is there. Then I say most patients have a hospital stay of seven to 10 days, but in 15% patients, because of a leak from a pancreatic anastomosis, the stay can be extended and it might even cause bleeding and they might have to go to the ICU. So, then they say, and I say, I cannot, I, I cannot identify who are those patients. Patients in the post-operative period, I always tell patients who have soft pancreas, undilated duct, during surgery, a problem, say, we have to try. I always spend more time with them in these patients immediately after surgery. I tell them the tumor has been removed, but the pancreas is very soft. We had to wait three to four days before pronouncing this operation to be a success. I'm concerned about this outcome on this patient. This is very, very important because patients always say, you never told us then. So I always tell them that we have to watch. The pancreas was very soft. It was like butter. So I had problems. We'll have to wait. First 48, 72 hours are there. So I keep telling them the trajectory of events. So in a, in a bad pancreas, it is very important to prognosticate to the patient. Have I answered your question? 
Yes, so basically it is good news after bad news is better than bad news after good news. Good news. So I always give bad news. Bad news is very important to communicate. If you have bad news, I think your news bulletins should be more often. Uh, do you have patients who come back? You've not put a drain. Patient has gone home on day seven. You're very happy. Returns. Oh, oh no, no. Uh, this is a very interesting concept. So if you would have realized that patients in whom you don't put a drain, they are the ones, they are best ones. They are yes. young. They have no problems. Yes. They are fit. The albumin is higher. They have no sepsis. So these patients will not come back. So like ERAS protocols, it's a self-selection. Because the ERAS protocols is good in patients because you can discharge them early, they are fitter, they are tolerated. So readmission Absolutely. rates are not higher, no. So because the bad patients will stay. So bad patients, you know, put two drains, they are the ones with come re-aspiration, they come with burst abdominals, they come with rate gastric emptying. So there's a two group of patients. So are you a very early discharger, an early discharger, or do you say that I will keep them for seven days irrespective of? Uh, no, I am a very, uh, I won't say, I, I, most of my patients, by day five, I come to know that they're going to be discharged by day seven or not. So by day of five, the picture becomes very clear. I can prognosticate and I can start, when the money bill starts rising, I tell them, yeah. no, no, it's okay. But if there are also a group of patients, I tell them there's a problem in hand. By day five or six, picture becomes very clear. Uh, you had briefly mentioned neoadjuvant therapy. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the Dutch who do all these fantastic randomized trials have just published yeah. that their leak rate was actually less yes. after neoadjuvant than that, afterwards. Uh, what that, is your experience and uh, okay. what would you but, like to say about oh, this? First of all, we do not have a large volume of patients. Yeah. We, don't, we are not believers in neoadjuvant because whatever patient we sent, we had very bad experiences. They got lost. They didn't follow the thing like that. But the ones they can't we, afford you. Yes. So they can't afford you. They don't come. They become, yep. What are the complications? Whatever it is. So the ones we operated, yes, the degree of the pancreas gets so small, thick pancreas that surgery actually after new adjuvant treatment is much easier. That the pancreatic is so firm, the leaks are virtually nil. When you cut the pancreas, you can see the pancreatic juice is not coming out. So surgery in these patients is comparatively easier. Do you feel that? There are different leak rates for the cystic neoplasms. This is a big burgeoning number. Yeah. The Memorial Sloan Kettering series where they did the pastorotide study at 40% cystic neoplasms of the pancreas. Do you think that you go for a simpler or less harmful indication and you land up in more problems and we have to be a little cautious on this? Uh, no, I won't agree on that. But uh, uh, the only thing I will say, it's a little uh, uh, collateral answer. In patients who have spent, we have a high chance of a biliary leak because the bile duct in them is not dilated. But pancreatic leak, uh, at least my experience, cystic neoplasms don't have high. Actually, IPMN is a very good thing to do an astomosis. Yeah, yeah. Duct is dilated, so they're not a problem, not in our problem. So uh, other audience members who don't have an opportunity, would you... Um... Any pressing questions on um, that side? Are we seeing any hands being raised? But I think the, you asked the best questions, Sudeep. I think amazing questions you asked. Well, I'm so, just passing uh, on the audience wisdom. We have, uh, we have two WhatsApp groups of uh, the same subject, an asymptomatic leak. Yeah. Uh, those who didn't get the opportunity to ask questions can join that group. That uh, link is given in the chat box. Uh, and you can, and Dr. Athar also probably will be joining that group. And yeah, yeah, I'm in the group. I'm in the group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He'll, uh, he'll be answering the questions. And uh, Mohsin SC has raised his hand. Can you please uh, unmute your mic and uh, ask the question directly? Hello, good evening. Yeah. I have a question. How to minimize post-operative pancreatic fistula after distal pancreatectomy and inoculation? Thank you, uh, sir. Okay, this uh, I, I'll quickly answer. My talk was on Whipple's. For distal pancreatectomy, the best way, which is literature says, is the individual suture ligation of the pancreatic duct is the best. That's the only single most uniform thing. Whether you do it by stapler or hands-on, it doesn't make a difference. So if you... If you uh, identify the uh, the pancreatic duct and suture transfix it. That's the best way to prevent a uh, leak. But leaks in distal pancreatectomy are more innocuous because that's a pure pancreatic fistula. Uh, 
Uh, Professor Abhay Dalvi is with us. He's the president elect of the Association of Surgeons of India. Not Sir, would you now raise onwards, your hand? Now onwards, he is the president because uh, the, uh, the the transfer is over. Yeah. No, no. Hi, Abhay. Yeah. You raised your hand, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, I just want for my knowledge, uh, Adarsh, you have voluminous experience in Whipple's. Uh, you said that the soft pancreas is a dangerous thing, which I always believe to be true. Now, how do you decide on a given patient whether will you do a pancreatic jejunostomy or a pancreatic gastrostomy? Let me uh, confess, I have joined in late. Uh, because of some other issues, yeah, yeah, yeah. I make it a point to join Baiju's invitation. So, <laughs> uh, 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 you will agree, Abhay, that we always follow one technique, and I always do a pancreatic jejunostomy. And even if it is soft or firm, it doesn't make a difference. I always do a pancreatic jejunostomy. And uh, if it's a, a, a soft one, the chance of leak, whether you gastrostomy or jejunostomy, doesn't make a difference. It's my bias. I my training and my uh, experience with one technique, I want to master it. But I know there are people who can do equally well a gastrostomy. But I am a believer of pancreatic jejunos. Yeah. So, Thank you, Abed Ali, sir. Um, no, I think uh, the, uh, the handover of uh, the presidency um, of uh, ASA was today. I think it was today, is it? <laughs> He doesn't look, his shoulders don't look burdened. He <laughs> looks to be relaxed. <laughs> so, can I ask you a question, Sudeep? Can I ask you a question to Sudeep? Sir, always. Sudeep, what is your experience of doing a completion pancreatectomy? I mean, have you done it? What right. Your... So, I have done a completion pancreatectomy on table once for a very fatty pancreas. Everything cut through and I was at a wit's end. And fortunately, the patient was a diabetic insulin dependent before the surgery. So I didn't feel guilty about it. That's right. That's and right. I, I just finished the job because I could sleep peacefully after that. That's Post-operatively, fortunately, uh, I've never had the chance to do it, though I've assisted a few in the UK in my training days. But here, you know, seeing what happened to those patients, <laughs> I can imagine that. I think you're better off with drainage. We have used a lot of open abdomens, yes, 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 uh, yes. which are very effective in getting collections out, relavages, but completions I, I have I, not done in the last 20 years. I think that's, it's an that's ominous thing. Yeah, that's right. That's, thank you very much for it. It's been a very honest discussion, I think. And Dr. Arun Kumar Amal has raised his hand. Dr. Arun Kumar from Tuandram. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Hi, hi, how are you? S sir, good. Very, very vibrant. Very, very positive talk, as always. And two, three things, apart from your experience, knowledge, the way you, 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 you put up things and your language is, is highly commendable, sir. Thank you so much. Let me just repeat one sentence which, which, you, which you told today. The negative pressure suction drains are positively harmful. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm Excellent. glad somebody. I'm glad somebody notices this. So, so, so many points. So many points I've noted down. Not just science, but the language as well. And Thank Sudeep you. sir moderated it to really? you know you, you, you yeah. beautifully well, beautifully well. So, so I have no work to do. You know the speakers. Oh, so no, 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 Sorry. Yeah, just one, one request. Yeah. What, what what percentage of your DG patients will have an a, a pancreatic leak? And vice versa, what percentage of your leak patients will have it? That's a good DG? question. Seventy-five percent of my pancreatic leaks will have delayed gastric emptying, but of my patients who have delayed gastric emptying, only about, <laughs> only about five to seven percent will have pancreatic leak. Thank you, you so Dr. much. Narvaria again. Uh, Doctor Narvaria, allow me to unmute. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, something about. Uh, can you throw some light on delayed gasting and the management in, uh, of delayed gasting emptying? Because that is what I think we missed in this lecture. Uh, 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 since it was on leaks, but I can answer this. Delayed gastric emptying, you know, there are two situations. One is which is associated with an intra-abdominal abscess. Second is for reasons which we do not understand. So first thing, if you have a delayed gastric emptying is to do a CT scan. If there is no collection, then majority of them will settle on their own. And uh, if it's a collection, you have to drain that collection. 
There's another trick which I will tell you today, that patients who present primarily with gastric outlet obstruction, they have a greater chance of having a great gastric obstruction because of duodenal cancer, like for example. In them, we'll always add a feeding jejunostomy. Otherwise, we don't add feeding jejunostomy routinely to our whipples. But a patient who presents with a delayed, uh, already with vomiting, we add a feeding jejunostomy. But if you don't have a collection, it nearly always settles on its own. Might take two weeks or something, but always settles on its own. Thank you. Thank you. I think Baju, we've done enough. Dr. Shastri is raising a hand. Yeah. Oh. Sir, go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to add uh, two more comments. One, uh, I'm glad uh, both uh, Sudeep and Adesh have emphasized on the communication part. One trick I follow uh, and found useful in communication is it's not just one sitting. The communication is always over two or three sittings. The first sitting is invariably the positive aspect of why we are doing the surgery and the need for surgery and the extent of surgery and things like that. At the same time, I always give them a, a take home material, ask them to read and then come back. And then if they have any questions, they should ask. And in the second sitting, first question I ask is to relate, to tell me what they have what they remember of what I told them. And then if uh, they've missed those points, which I emphasize in my write-up, like the complications, I'll ask them, what do you know about the complications? Find out about the complications from them and then uh, go on to the complications in the second sitting, if necessary in the third. That I found uh, quite useful in a, over a period of time, they would realize the importance of the surgery and and of course, the complication. This I follow in uh, all the surgeries where the complication rate is high, say 25 to 30%. Uh, the second comment is, uh, see, when we had learned Whipple's 40 to 50 years back, they always used to put a T-tube, put a pancreatic, external pancreatic drain tube. Now, uh, T-tube, of course, nobody puts, but um, the external pancreatic drainage in a, uh, a bad anastomosis, how us useful is it? Um, I've resorted to, for past few ripples, I've been doing that when uh, there is a doubt about the anastomosis, the high risk leak, I leave a external pancreatic drain. What is the experience? Sir, uh, sir, I mean, uh, to, uh, the answer to these questions is, Best on your personal experience, it serves well in your thing, it's good. But literature doesn't say it's routinely needed. So, I mean, if it, anything that works well in your hands should be continued to do that, to say it's good or bad. I'm not done, done it, so I don't know. But it absolutely makes sense it should work. But uh, if you talk of literature-based, there is no evidence. I know of only one trial from Hong Kong which said that transanastomotic stents had better outcome. But there are many other studies which say that it's not the standard of care. But... In your hands, it works well. So you should never change a winning team. We must continue with it. Uh, Adarsh, can I ask you a philosophical question at this please point? Do, please do, please do. Sir, uh, have, do you feel that your technique is still evolving or we can't get any better? Oh, it's still evolving. It's still evolving. Every, I mean, uh, it is still evolving because I'm not perfect. I have a lot of like uni in this. They're still performing. I realize that there are many things which you understand, you, there are small nuances, which, like I say, knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers. Wisdom is still coming, and uh, they're still evolving, still evolving. So where do you think we can get better with the technique? Okay. Uh, the, uh, it is the, my assessment is a little a shade better. Now I can assess better my realization that this patient is going to have a stormy post-operative course. For some reason, if you ask me what it is, I cannot put it into words. Yeah. There is something visceral you can come to know about that things are not looking good. When things don't look good, I think you should realize it. Like I said in my sentence that signals are very important. Noises come later. You should develop a heightened sensitivity and that comes from observation. To say, I can say, oh, this, 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 it can't be put into words. I'm sure you also have realized in the post-operative yeah. period, you see the patient doesn't look well. There is something that is amiss. 
patients don't lie. There are some things which are going wrong. I have realized if on the first post-operative day, urine output is decreasing, to me, it's a very ominous sign. So there are small, subtle things which are happening, which tell you that things are going wrong. So that's how you evolve. You observe more and you see. So have I answered your question in a reasonably philosophical way? Oh, that, that's, but, but just about your finer points of surgical technique. Uh, okay. The sutures, the okay. magnification, the lights. Do you think we can get any better than this? Uh, I think a couple of things I have realized that small things. One of the things I've realized is that once you're doing the pancreatic anastomosis and you take the bleeding occurs, you think that bleeding will get well with the suture and you'll tie it off. It doesn't happen. You must stop the bleeders individually. Yeah. Because what happens is then later it bleeds to stop that you disturb the entire anastomy. And I sincerely believe that once the resection part is over, you must take a pause. That's when you see all the unsinted process, bleeding is there, DJ flexure where bleeding is occurred. Everything should be done at that phase because once reconstruction starts, then it becomes a problem to stop that. And I think two things are most dangerous in Whipple's. One is ischemic injury, second is a bleeder. You should not cause any ischemic injury because I have made mistakes like getting the hepatic artery thinking to be the gastrodurnal artery, damaging the solitary hepatic, uh, replaced right hepatic artery. Ischemic injuries, you pay the result for it. And second is hemostasis is crazy because you operate a patient post-operative for bleeding, you don't find the source, you search around, you break the anastomosis and then the vicious cycle starts. Uh, so, Dr. Arun Kumar has put up a, another interesting scientific question. Do you see there's a chance of staplers in the future, some sort of joining devices which will take away the difficulty in this? Or do you think this is... Uh, human uh, com Computers can never replace human beings. Staplers can never replace where you have to have a use of emotion and sensitivity. I don't think staplers can ever replace pancreatic anastomosis. I think, uh, Baju, we worked hard. Yeah. <laughs> Sudip, uh, your final words. Yeah, so I think that has been a fantastic discussion. There's been great audience participation and we have learned a huge amount from one of the most experienced pancreatic surgeons in, his, in, 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 in the country. And hopefully some of your wrinkles will spare some of our wrinkles in future. And thank you very much, Dr. Baju, for this opportunity. And we hope to continually participate in these fantastic seminars. Uh, Baju, Thank can you I make all a, very Baju, much. can I make a comment? Please, please, please. I have, must have done so many webinars and so many uh, things. This is one of the best moderators I've got. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of the most, he asked the most incisive and lethal questions in a very systematic way. I think he deserves all our respect and salutations for the way he conducted. So Deep, I'm so proud of you. What a beautiful way you conducted. Yeah, actually, yeah. actually, I selected him because I knew him very well. That uh, he's... He... I love this thing about you, taking credit for everything. <laughs> <laughs> he is a treasure man of knowledge. Uh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. No, the, absolutely. The greatest fool can ask more questions than the no, wisest no, no, Dr. No, Chaudhary no, can no, ask. No, it doesn't. No, no. You, your questions were loaded. There are a lot of substance and they are, all of them were relevant. It's, it's a pleasure interacting with you. And thank you so much for giving me an opportunity and letting me express my streams of thought. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Adar Sodhari, sir, for uh, accepting my invitation and joining for the second uh, lecture on anastomotic like uh, And uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, questions again. I'll answer them the, on the WhatsApp group. Uh, uh, please answer them in the WhatsApp group. There is actually two WhatsApp groups. Okay. One is already full with the two members. So okay. I, I started another group. So please join that group. I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. Uh, so please answer to the question, Dr. Sudhir, you are added, added to the group. And thank, thank you, Dr. Sudhir, for the excellent moderation as uh, everybody is telling. And there are a lot of uh, uh, comments about uh, that moderation in the chat box. Thank you so much for joining us.
please continue to join the future webinars also. This is the 26th webinar. And the next webinar we are going to have with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Surabhan uh, Bale Rao. And that is about uh, organ prostate and preambulary tumor. I will be moderating. Till then, uh, bye for all. Good night. Good night.